The paper that I've uh, written is called Steps Toward an Archaeology of Self-Liberation. It's a project I've been working on for a while. Um, complete, not completed yet by any means, but at the end I'll talk about where I think this project uh, is going. Um, scholars of all disciplinary backgrounds have been invest in interested in the subject of liberation for many years. Before the 1960s, anthropologists, historians, and sociologists had studied overt rebellions pursued by peasants and slaves with works by Athecker, Hill, uh, Tilly, Hobsbawm, and Wolf being prominent among them. More recently, attention has shifted somewhat away from overt rebellion and toward the more nuanced everyday resistances that are now widely known as the, quote, weapons of the weak. Anthropologists have played an especially large role in detailing the subtleties of everyday resistance with ethnographic studies of Bedouin women in Egypt, dairy farmers in rural France, and Shia women in Pakistan serving as important examples. In my own field of historical archaeology, some archaeologists have investigated the material expressions of everyday resistance in many socio-historical settings, perhaps most visibly on slave-holding plantations and among Chinese immigrants. This research has produced important findings and provided new directions of inquiry. Perhaps one of the most evocative findings is the discovery of Minkisi spirit bundles buried in houses associated with enslaved women and men on the east coast of the United States. And I don't need to tell this audience about these, but this is one from New York City uh, that may or may not be well known uh, out here, way out here in the east. <laughs> Uh, these collections of mundane, albeit powerful, objects have tangibly demonstrated the ability of the oppressed to find ways of expression, even within the confines of lifelong bondage. More recently, a small number of archaeologists have begun to investigate labor relations and labor rebellions with the massacres at mining camps in Ludlow, Colorado, and Latimer, Pennsylvania. Paul Shackle and some of the rest of you, actually. Uh, standing as the best examples. Overall, however, historical archaeologists have shown considerably less interest in overt rebellion than cultural anthropologists and other social scholars. This oversight may reflect the generally conservative nature of historical archaeology and its often parochial perspective. But whatever the cause, I believe it is possible to develop a rigorous approach to interpreting the relationships between materiality and meaning in context of physical struggle for self-liberation. My view is that post-Columbian archaeology has an especially important role to play and a re responsibility in investigating the drive for self-liberation among peoples dominated by colonialism, imperialism, and racialization, and in explicating the connections between rebellion and materiality. To put this in the form of a question, how can archaeology contribute to the interpretation of struggle, resistance, and liberation in contexts fraught with violence and repression? In keeping with my general view about the importance of creating a truly international historical archaeology, I argue for the use of specific, that is locally framed cases of rebellion to develop a better understanding of the material expressions of rebellion in transnational global contexts, and to develop material perspectives on what Piven and Cloward term patterns of insurgency in their influential book, Poor People's Movements. My hope is that archaeologists can transcend the appeal of single-site analysis for the more difficult, but I think ultimately more rewarding, understanding of the many linkages between rebellion and material consumption to demonstrate how material culture is used to create collectivities of action in a hostile world. To begin this effort, I draw on two specific case studies with, with which I'm familiar. One of these examples, the 17th century maroon community of Palmeiras in today's state of Alagoas, Alagoas Brazil, may be familiar to you because it correlates with Dan Sayers' research in the Great Dismal Swamp. But the second, uh, the second will be uh, probably be unfamiliar to you because it's a 19th century tenant farming community in Ballykilcline, County Roscommon, Ireland. 
These wildly different examples provide an intriguing starting point for the development of a rigorous analytical approach to the archaeology of self-liberation. The Maroon, or Quilambo of Palmeiras, located in northeast Brazil, was created around 1604 by enslaved Africans who had fled the coastal sugar plantations for the more remote backlands. Their efforts to establish their own self-governed polity in the Brazilian interior were an unmistakable statement of self-liberation and a strong blow against the Europeanization of African peoples in the New World. Scholars have disagreed about the precise socio-political organization of Palmares, and so have variously referred to it as a republic, a kingdom, and even a state. While the precise organization may be debatable, we do know that the community consisted of at least 10 separate but interlinked villages ruled by men and women arranged in a hierarchy under a single leader who lived in the largest settlement. Putting the community in terms they could understand, European observers referred to the leader as the great lord and his village as the royal stockade. And the evidence the Europeans provide suggests that the leadership structure was kin-based and hereditary reflecting roots in Angola, the likely birthplace of many or perhaps most of its residents. At its height, the total population of Palmeiras was said to be between 6,000 and 10,000, and it was reported that they subsisted on uh, horticultural produce, domesticated fowl, and fish. This is a, a photo that's widely thought to be an example of Palmeiras or a picture of Palmeiras, although historians are beginning to disagree that that is may be the case. In any case, it's from the 1647 uh, Barleas, um, which I uh, saw in the uh, Newberry Library in Chicago. But I want to bring up this next picture. It's not as good an image. It's not a great image. It's from the uh, Dutch Brazil, published in 1923. And if you were to look up this book, this Barleas book, this is the one you would find. It's the 1923 because there's only this one that I know of in Chicago. I, I bring this, these two up to show you this. This little guy. Somewhere between 1647 and 1923, someone felt compelled to put a brutish guy up in this watchtower for whatever reason. I think it's just to show the brutality that they as associated uh, with Palmaris. While the validity of the population estimates may al also may be debated, we do know that Palmaris was a large, vibrant community of discrete villages that thumbed its nose at two major European superpowers, Portugal and the Low Countries, every day its, of its existence. Maroon communities, by their very nature, constitute a threat to the dominant power and economic structure of European colonialism. As a result, both the Dutch and the Portuguese worked to destroy Palmares with a series of attacks and counterattacks beginning in the 1640s. The Portuguese were finally successful in 1694 when they attacked the villages and killed or re-enslaved its residents. They also captured and executed Zumbi, the Quilambu's final and most revered leader. As many of you may know, Zumbi's name continues to resonate, through, resonate throughout the Brazilian Northeast, where he is today widely remembered and revered. As in the photo Zumbi, where you get your pictures taken, or uh, developed, the Zumbi beer distributor, and the Zumbi on the side of the bus depot, pointing out how to get to, the, how to, get to his house. The particular situation experienced at Ballykilcline in Central Ireland was much different in its historical details. At its height in the 1840s, the, the townland, which was the smallest administrative unit in Ireland, had a population of over 500 people who lived as tenant farmers and paid rent to an elite Anglo-Irish family. The tenants grew potatoes for food and cereal crops for rent, and many of them raised the a pig, a cow, and possibly a few chickens. They called their pig the gentleman who pays the rent, which I think is a very nice thing to call your pig. Until 1834, the Bailey Kilcline landlord was the powerful Mann family who lived nearby in the 
Palladian style Strokes Found Park House. In 1834, however, when the family failed to negotiate a new lease, Bally Kilkline Klein became a crown estate. That meant that Princess Victoria became the landlady. Three years later, of course, she became Queen Victoria, the most powerful monarch in the world. Realizing that she was in London and probably much too preoccupied to pay attention to their lives in faraway rural Ireland, the people of Ballykilcline promptly declared a rent strike. Unfortunately for them, however, the Queen's commissioners of revenues were paying attention, and so they began to send armed bailiffs to collect the overdue rents. This action set off a 12-year running battle between the tenants and the forces of the Crown, a conflict that included armed assaults, arrests, mob action, and the destruction of the tenants' houses. And because it was a Crown estate, they have incredibly detailed records of, of how these conflicts played out. You'd have the bailiffs come up the road, and then the people would chase them away with pitchforks, and the bailiffs would come back up the road and lock the ho people's houses, and then the bailiffs would leave, and they'd break into the houses and live there again, and it went on like that for 12 long years. Um, Eventually, however, during the darkest years of the Great Famine, 1847 to 1840, or, and 1848, the bailiffs finally managed forcibly to evict the families of, Bill, of Bally Kilcline and tear down their houses. The families were forced to walk to Dublin, about 60 miles to the east. From there, they boarded boats that eventually carried them to the U.S., where they dispersed after reaching the port of New York. And Adam. Did some go to, I think so. yeah, some may have went, had gone to Mer Texas, Maryland, yeah. So there, there were some nearby here, apparently. Um, the descendants of the evictees, now living across the United States, have organized themselves into a society called the Bally Kilkline Society to research their family histories and to commemorate their resilience and survival. Interesting thing that I discovered is that the Irish who owned the land were only tangentially interested in their history. The real st stakeholders of the archaeology were American citizens because they were the people who had been evicted and come over here um, in the 1840s. Um, okay, with, ev with uh, even this brief introduction of both places, the one thing that immediately strikes us about them is how different they appear. The first difference, of course, is temporal. Palmaris is 17th century in date, whereas Ballykilcline belongs to the 19th century. So the two are separated by almost two centuries. A second difference is that the people in both places were fighting different empires. Palmaris fought the Dutch and the Portuguese. Ballykilcline fought the British. And these empires had different histories and traditions, and each one pursued its goals in unique ways. Third, the rebellious were situated within different extractive economies. Pal Palmaris was a slave-based sugar economy. Bally Kilcline was a tenant-based econ tenant economy uh, rooted in rent, rent payments. Fourth, they were culturally distinct. Palmaris was displaced Africans, whereas pa Bally Kilcline was composed of 100% native Irish. And finally, each had different experiences with freedom. The people of Palmaris were in actual bondage, whereas the residents of Bala Kilcline, though not enslaved, were effectively in economic bondage. The Irish were considerably freer than the enslaved workers on Brazilian plantations, but they still lived under, under the control of a foreign invader. Given these obvious distinctions, it seems impossible to think of these two places in the same sentence. Each appears completely unique and thus seemingly must be studied in these terms. Many historical archaeologists uh, would agree, and at one scale, this assessment is perfectly fine so far as it goes. Without question, intensive site analysis constitutes the most basic element of serious archaeological research. I have no disagreement with this rational thinking. But at the same time, I believe it is possible to fall prey to what David Harvey refers to as bottomless fragmentation and, and ephemerality, to reach a point where the, where the minute becomes the sole focus. An exclusive focus on the small things forgotten makes it less likely that archaeologists will be able to contribute to knowledge uh, about the many ideas, practices, and processes 
that extended far beyond any one site's discrete spatial boundaries. I believe that historical archaeology, as the archaeology of our modern world, has a special responsibility to contribute to understanding why the world today is as it is. One of the great paradoxes of today's archaeology is that while historical archaeology is expanding throughout the globe at an unprecedented rate, now being practiced in places never before imagined, much archaeology of the past 500 years seems rooted in particularism. Part of the reason may relate to the overwhelming presence of commercially based archaeology because most historical archaeologists today practice in the private sector. Now again, there's nothing inherently wrong with the local level of, of analysis, but my fear is that historical archaeology might become trivialized as being only about the small things with keeping blinders on about the world at large. I believe that one remedy to bottomless fragmentation is a multi-scalar approach that allows the archaeologists to tack back and forth between a unique, unique archaeological site and all the larger worlds that existed beyond it. As I wrote a few years ago, archaeologists researching the past 500 years must think globally and dig locally. And I was so happy when I was at the national meeting of the Brazilian archaeologists last year in a town called Aracaju, which is on the coast. It's a beautiful little place. But there was a girl that had that on her t-shirt. And I thought, oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, felt, I took her picture and felt really vindicated. I should put it up on my wall. Um, I used two general models to guide my research. In the first model, I ad adopt the metaphor of a photographer using a micro-macro zoom lens. And I use the term frame to indicate the various scales of analysis. In the micro fr frame, our photographer standing in a field of wildflowers can focus on a single flower or even one part of a single flower. But in the very next moment, using the lens's zoom capabilities, she can photograph the entire field of flowers. She can even take a series of pictures at various medium ranges and all without changing her position in the field. The flowers lose their individuality in the wide view, but the field would have little content without them. The individual flowers create the image, but how we see them depends upon our analytical frame. The same is true of archaeological analysis. How and what we interpret depends on, our, on the frames we employ. This perspective shares similarities with Brodel's use of individual social and geographic time in its use of various frames of analysis, with the most salient point being that the use of multiple frames is the goal. Now, there isn't too much that's terribly new uh, here. Archaeologists have used multiscalar analysis for, for some time. Still, I think it's important to make the framing concept explicit, if for no other reason than to keep it fresh in the analyst's mind throughout the process of research. In addition, issues of scale continue to nag archaeologists, historians, and other social researchers who seek to link the local with the global. The second model I use combines the framing concept with network theory and the resilience of social networks connected through time and space or what I call vertical and horizontal networks. We can envision this model as a series of levels, and in this case there are three. I see the horizontal networks as being created within the same socio-historical frame, which for, which for Palmaris would be 1604 to 1694, and for Bally Kilcline from 1800 to 1848. But again, other frames are entirely possible. For example, we could decide to analyze a frame of covert uh, conflict. For, for Palmaris, this would be the 50 years from the 1640s to the 1690s. And for Bally Kilcline, the 14 years from 1834 to 1848. But the central point is that the archaeological context, however we choose to view it, constitutes a horizontal frame. The vertical networks are composed of linkages that stretch into both the past and the future. My view is that the network linkages at any single archaeological site do not terminate with the physical boundaries of the site, or in other words, that the horizontal network connections can be regional, transnational, or even transcontinental. Thus, for Palmaris, one lower frame will be situated in Africa, probably in Angola, 
one of the key features of network inspired archaeology is that no pre-established no pre boundaries need exist. The analyst must go where the relevant social and material networks go. So for this, I'm actually just viewing these various networks in, in, or nodes in this network. And I'm thinking about the history that would come like before the history of Palmares that might take place in Angola and then what that means to the archaeologists today and how it's analyzed and what it means today. But it can mean almost anything that you would choose. Um, thus, if we return to the first model, or the, you know, the first model to consider Palmaris and Valley Kilcline by moving up the analytical framework, we can begin to notice some fascinating similarities between these disparate places. First, both the people of Palmaris and Valley Kilcline took divisive, uh, decisive action for self liberation. In the case of Palmaris, they sought to, a complete removal from the slave regime. In Balakilkline, they sought removal from oppressive tenancy. Neither group had anything to gain by working within the system, and they could only practice real self-determination by removing themselves from these exploitative systems, if at all possible. Second, both groups defied the might and authority of great empires. At the time of their rebellions, the Dutch, Portuguese, and British empires were vastly powerful, and each had abundant oppressive force, each nation could, and eventually did, bring down on those who had the audacity to rebel. Agency extended only so far and for so long, and both communities were abandoned and destroyed, never to be reoccupied. Third, each group was distinct in culture and language from those who oppressed them. There's some evidence that the leaders of Palmaris may have originally spoken a Bantu language, and the people of Balakilkline were native Gaelic speakers, a language wholly unlike English. Fourth, though the cultural distance between them and their oppressors defined them as others, their removal from the oppressor's systems, even if only temporarily, redefined their otherness. The oppressor's view of the oppressed was affirmed by their very res uh, resistance. It reaffirmed the oppressor's view that African slaves and Celtic tenant farmers were as untrustworthy as they believed them to be. But seen another way, by embracing their otherness, other, otherness, both rebelling groups visibly affirmed their otherness. In other words, the racialization used to define both groups as inferior was turned on its head, effectively becoming a tool of insurgency. And fifth, that both groups established horizontal networks that allowed them to survive in a hostile world as they maintained their cognitive ties to earlier networks through traditions and customs. Both groups were savvy enough to create viable networks of collaboration that allowed them to resist the vast powers of imperial Europe. Historical records indicate that the residents of Palmaris created and maintained a series of horizontal network connections with local native South Americans and with colonial Portuguese settlers living along the frontier. The colonial Portuguese power structure realized the threat that these connections posed uh, to their control of the empire. And in 1670, the colonial governor of Pernambuco was furious with the local Portuguese settlers who passed firearms on to Palmares. Seventeen years later, another governor threatened to imprison anyone even suspected of giving support to the community, regardless of the offender's social standing or, quote, noble birth. Other, report, other reports state that European colonists frequently pass Palmaris information about impending attacks, surely something that the elites perceived as, highly, as high treason. It seems that the Portuguese rural settlers because they were not linked into the elite power network, sought to create their own connections with individuals identified as outlaws, thereby, thereby effectively becoming what would later be termed race traitors. Unfortunately, the concrete ways the people of Palmaris use material culture to create a rebellious collectivity has yet to be established. During our survey at the Serra de Bahiga, thought to be the site of the so-called Royal Stockade, Pedro Fanari and I uh, discovered 10 sites, many of which contained colonial Dutch and Portuguese tin glazed earthenwares. 
The presence of these wares substantiates the historical accounts of the maintenance of outside contacts, but it provides little concrete information. But we can return to Valley Kilcline to obtain further clues. A common view by historians is that the Irish tenant farmers, because they were peasants, had little if any material culture. For example, when his historian Robert Scally published his History of Valley Kilcline in 1995, he described the people as ragged, shoeless, and uncombed, and said that they owned only objects that they could make themselves. And this was a common, common thinking in Ireland that they made, used and, and made and used only wooden and straw vessels since they were only uh, peasant peoples. However, when we excavated two house sites at Ballykilcline, we discovered that he was completely wrong. He also said the house, the uh, big house that the um, Protestant minister lived in, the Glebe house, wasn't there had long been demolished, and I ate lunch there every day. So it was another historian who didn't know about the ground. Um, the two sites revealed an abundant collection of mass-produced imported objects, most of which were unfamiliar and undoubtedly imported from Great Britain. This is the one that was most unfamiliar to me, was this one here. It's this ceramic egg. I'm told that if you show a chicken an egg, it'll lay an egg. That's what they say. I don't know anything about chickens, so nope. Uh, among the ceramics alone, we can see the variety and amount of, amount of material brought into the tenants' houses. Each house had a great deal of the refined earthenwares of the sort that were made in English factories of Staffordshire and used around the world. Now, unlike Palmaris, where we had only historical documentation to suggest the creation of a complex support network, all the available narratives about rural Ireland stress the backwardness and insularity of the Irish peasantry. Based on this perception, the tenants shouldn't have had teacups and saucers or dinner plates and platters, and a soup tureen should have been completely unknown to them. They were supposed to have eaten their meals out of a common iron kettle placed in the middle of the floor, as in that picture there. They weren't supposed to sit at tables sipping tea from blue and white teacups decorated with dragons and eating their meals from blue transfer printed plates. But yet these items were all present at the seven tenant houses we excavated in Ireland, including the two at Valley Kilcline. And this is what an excavated stone house actually looks like in the ground. It doesn't look like much because it's been knocked down by the authorities, the bailiffs, who've knocked it down, taken the big stones away to build walls and other things, and just left this scatter of small stones and artifacts behind. Notice how shallow it is. Basically, you just peel the sod off and these houses are there. Uh, what happened is once they evicted the people, it became pasture land, and it stayed pasture land until we showed up in the 19, early 90s and I'm convinced it's probably pasture land right now. And these levelers, these guys who would knock these houses down were very, very good because you would never ever know there was a house under this pasture if you were to walk this land. We found these things always using geophysics. Valley Kilcline was a little different in a sense there was a really good map uh, because it was the Queen's property but it still took geophysics to find these places. Um, the artifacts then demonstrate that the people of Valley Kilcline, separated by 200 years and thousands of miles from Palmaris, had developed a similar survival strategy based on the development and maintenance of horizontal social networks. A complex web of network connections helped both groups survive within an impressive system of, of exploitation. The networks facilitated, communicated, and even symbolized their struggles. What interests me as an archeologist are the material expressions of rebellion and how these might be represented in various practices in different network contexts. Without question, as we know, some resistance can be muted. It's clear that the Valley Kilcline tenants purposely did not improve the exteriors of their houses because if they did, the rents would increase and they would be evicted and replaced with someone more suitable, meaning a non-Gaelic speaking Protestant family. But just like the people of Palmaris, they sought to separate themselves 
from the power structure as much as they could, but unlike the inhabitants of Palmyris, they could not physically remove themselves. But both created network relations that stretched their associations far beyond the limits of their settlements, and some of these connections were rooted in materiality. For Ballykilkline, Kilkline, if we focus on the ceramics alone, we can say that their networks of materiality stretched into English factories as well as into hundreds of households stretching from Britain to the United States. If the 17th century ceramics we found at the Ceja de Bahiga really are associated with Palmeiras, then we can say that their material networks extended throughout the Portuguese empire. So in essence, what we see in overt resistance is the manipulation of networks of materiality that have significant cultural consequences. A power struggle exists within the dominant, those who wish to maintain the connections of domination and oppression, and the dominated, those who strive to transform the dominant network by creating new connections. It seems that network transformation always includes a significant material component that is still poorly understood. At Palmeiras and Valley Kilkline, we begin to get the tiniest glimpse of the connection between materiality and rebellion but a deep understanding currently remains elusive. We were unable to establish absolute linkages for, for Palmeiras, except through a few scattered historical references. However, the richness of the historical record at Bally Kilkline, because of the rent strike, made it possible to map the rebellious cohorts over time and to relate these cohorts to the sequence of events during the rent strike. And this is a map of the houses with the various families that were interconnected and that fought the various bailiffs on these various roads that they came in. Like when these guys came in here, this group would be the initial contact and the same would be at this crossroads here and, and these other roads had these people who were connected uh, to, uh, to one another. The cohort mapping allowed us to see how the various tenant families established links that helped them create, maintain, transform, and stabilize their collectivities. My current project, in addition to the to two projects I'm doing in Brazil, concerns the Isla de Providencia, or Providence Island. Providence Island is located 110 miles off the coast of Nicaragua. It's actually owned by Colombia. It has a number of characteristics that make it a superb place to investigate contact, conflict, and resistance. It was one of the first English colonies in the Caribbean, certainly the, or one of the earliest in the Western Caribbean. It was small, it was only 15 square miles in size. It was occupied by the English for only 11 years from 1630 to 1641. That's going to be a beautiful archeological horizon. Many of the charter members of the Providence Island Company were leaders of the uh, uh, Civil War against King Charles. It was the site of the first slave rebellion in the English-speaking world on May 1st, 1638. And one resident was one of the first Englishmen to speak against slavery on moral grounds. The number of conflictual associations that ultimately doomed the English settlement occurred during the 11 years that the English lived on Providence Island. These are just some of the conflicts that occurred within this little 15 mile area. The one was between the owners of the Providence Island Company who were all English Puritans and the, the planters are the people who became the, the tenant farmers. They wanted to own land but they, the owners wouldn't allow it. It was their property. Uh, another conflict was between the planters and the indentured servants who went out to Providence Island. And then, of course the indentured servants were hoping to get their own land. Another interesting conflict is between planters and enslaved Africans, but also enslaved Pequots. After the war, uh, so-called Pequot War in New England, the English didn't know what to do with the captured Pequot Indians. They sent them down to Providence Island. So you've got Pequot Indians there, as well as enslaved uh, Africans. And then you often discovered in the literature that the enslaved Africans and the unenslaved indentured servants were joining together to fight the planters. Now additional conflict, conflicts were religious observance between Puritans who were acting like Puritans and the other people who wanted to play cards and dance. 
another problem was with pirates. There were all, always pirates there. Captain Morgan, the rum guy, was there. Uh, and another interesting group in the intermixed here is the Mosquito Indians on the coast of Nicaragua who were also on Providence Island. Now in addition to all that happening in those 11 years, there was almost constant attacks by their, the main external threat, which was the Spaniards who didn't want the English there. They attacked in 1635, were defeated, attacked in 1640 and were defeated, attacked in 1641 and finally were successful and took the island. So those are all conflicts that were happening uh, on this little Providence Island. One of the intriguing elements of the history of the island is the creation of at least one maroon community that's known. Uh, this community shows up in a map that was compiled by a cultural geographer, James uh, Parsons, in 1956, who identified a place called Maroon Hill down here. And also this little creek is called Provision Ground Creek. Now what's interesting about these places is this is the, where the English Puritans established their town called New Westminster. And if you look at this little map of this tiny island, that's about as far as you can go away from the English settlement and still be on the island. And there are also many accounts of the uh, escaped um, enslaved peoples jumping on boats and running off in this area to go join the Mosquito Indians. So there's a lot happening in this tiny little place. Now this research is really just beginning and there are many directions that it can go. So much has happened on that little island. The key point, however, is that one goal of the effort is to continue finding ways that archaeological research, when coupled with historical and anthropological evidence, can be used to understand and interpret the materiality of violence, resistance, and resilience. The greater goal, of course, is to find ways to translate the archaeological findings from the rarefied world of academic discourse to the real world as it exists today. And I saw many examples of students doing that, which is really exciting. This is difficult, I mean, just a few minutes ago, students in the room. <laughs> this, is difficult and this is a difficult and demanding challenge, as everyone knows, but one that increasing numbers of archaeologists are willing to take on as they attempt as anthropologists to make the world's history and development better understood. Part of our ability to transform the future must derive from our willingness to confront the realities of history. This then is the goal of modern world archaeology as I understand it. And I, I can finish with a nice little, nice little picture of coastal Brazil. Thank you very much. I'd certainly be happy to answer questions if you have any. If you want to go to Brazil, <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> Do you think that's pleasant? <laughs> Actually, that's Brazilian winter. Yeah, sure. No, there's absolutely nothing unique about it. It was just that the, the, in the 18, from about 1780 to about 1800, the population of Ireland was exploding and people were just living where they could live. I never saw anything as to why they selected that area, that particular place. Um, there, there's no association with the area and old names like there are in some places. Like in Donegal, you go there and it's all these old names that have always been there. I knew three guys in Donegal named uh, Joe Gallagher, three guys with the same name. That's why I always felt sorry for those genealogists that go to Ireland looking for Patrick Murphy, <laughs> you know. So I don't know why they were there, but um, you know, it was there for that short period and then it was gone. 
Yeah. Yes? Um, one of the things you mentioned was that the diasporic descendant community of Valley Compline was more interested in the land or the people that live on the land today. Yeah. Do you, is there any descendant community in Brazil associated with this settlement or, or is there any? Do you have any sort of co co yeah. comparison there? That's a good question. And it, it, um, the best analogy I can make, it's like George Washington slept here that you were talking about in Alexandria. Zumbi is such a huge figure. Everybody would want to be part of Zumbi, be part of Zumbi, the Zumbi experience, I'll call it. In fact, recently, a big thing came out that Zumbi was really gay. And the gay community then was part of the Zumbi thing. So it depends. what He's what you want him to be, really. And you could find people that there is a group that claim they were at Palmeiras. But nobody really knows if that's true, because there were so many maroon communities in Brazil. They were all over the place. And then this particular community had 10 villages at least, and maybe even more. And it's extremely political. If you, anything dealing with Zumbi is really, really political. And, and we, uh, I've worked with Pedro Fonari forever, and he's very well connected. And he even had trouble getting us into that area. And the town we were in had cholera. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like people were flocking to it. <laughs> but, you know. But that's a very good question. And it's something that is really serious in, in um, Brazil, is exactly this whole Afro-Brazilian culture and where it comes from. They've also claimed that Zumbi created soccer. <laughs> OK. Just let, let that one sink in for a while, <laughs> knowing about all those Brazilian soccer players, footballers, yes. Yes. Okay. The, um, uh, the planters, can you clarify? They were, um, rent, they were paying rent, but they were um, above indentured servants and slaves. Yeah. The, so, but, yeah. The idea was that these these twelve guys in in uh, twelve Puritans in England created this company, and they would have these guys go out into this little island and pay them rent and set up a Puritan colony. And they would pay rent. But the idea would, they, their idea, the planter's idea was that they would get their rents from the, tenant, the uh, indentured servants and the other people working for them. And that's how they would generate enough money to pay the rents. It never worked out. They never were successful. Yeah. Yeah, they're all oppressed by the 12 guys living in London, none of whom ever saw Providence Island and had no experience with it. And there's some real interesting linkages between Bermuda and Puritan Massachusetts. That's why the Pequots end up down there, because the Puritans in Massachusetts have a kinship with the Puritans on Providence Island. And the guy who was opposed to slavery, they just made him go back to England. He was a, a, a reverend. And they just said, you, you know, you've got to come home. <laughs> we can't have that. Yeah, Adam? There's horizontal networks. Do you find the rent strike inspiring other rent strikes in Ireland? And then in Palmeiras, other rural communities forming in Brazil or America? Well, there's certainly talk that. The descendants of Palmeiras went off and started another Quilombo, and it's probably true. Uh, in Valley Kilcline, County Roscommon was famous for its rebellions. There's been books written just about the rebellions in County Roscommon. So um, my own feeling is that because it was squashed so violently, it probably didn't lead itself to any kind of uproar. But the guy who owned the, plant, the, um, the big house, the major man was murdered uh, by the t by somebody. So I mean, 
Ross Common always had that kind of thing, any how going, always rebellious. Um, it, we selected Ross Common and Sligo and Donegal because those were the places that were most affected by the famine. And we wanted to see uh, how this worked. Uh, actually, the thing that got me to work in Ireland was the writings of Frederick Douglass, strangely enough, because Douglass always or often went to Ireland and spoke about slavery and its comparison to Irish tenant farming. And he would go to Cork and uh, Galway and Dublin and Belfast and draw these huge crowds. And I became interested in how, how that would, you know, how that looked on the ground, that similarity or dissimilarity. And I discovered that nobody had done that kind of archaeology in Ireland ever. So I had to like invent the thing myself, which I didn't really intend to do. But there, were no, there was no data at all. The Irish didn't do that kind of thing. They still don't do it. And the Irish archaeologist told me when he came out to look at that site, he said, I would have dug right through this and never even given it a second thought. So. So it was my interest in slavery that actually got me doing this Irish work. Yes? Um, I have a question about Harvest Island. When the, the British occupation, you said, was what, like 14 years? Or yeah, 11 years. So you, when it transitions to, to the Spanish occupation, which is significantly longer, yes. do they just adopt the same uh, structure that the British had? Um, do you see a continuation of, of these rebellions and conflicts into the Spanish period, or does is there enough of a shift in ideology and occupation to, to change that? Yeah, those are fantastic questions. The thing is, there's been two books written about the English on Providence Island and silence on the, on the uh, Spanish. So we don't know a thing about it. Um, I am working with Jane Landers, who's a famous historian that does that kind of work with the Spanish. And she's starting to find documents. There's a lot of documents apparently about the Spanish period and this, actually the Spanish takeover. One of the interesting things about actually when the Spanish were successful in attacking, let me see if I can go back to that map. Let's see. No, no I lost it. Don't look, it'll make you crazy. <laughs> there it is. When the Spanish attacked, they actually came this way up through by the Maroon community. Now, whether they had anything to do with that, we don't really know at this point. But it certainly is an interesting idea that they would go that way because the English all entered this, entered through this other area where the large, small circle is. That was where they had their settlements. And there were forts all along that they'd built all along these posts, uh, these points rather. Uh, uh, but the Spanish attacked on the southeast part of the island, closer, close to the Maroon community. I don't know if that's just accidental or if it was planned, but it would make a lot of sense. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>